bring all your failures, all your addictions. You know, I, John 3.16, that's based on John 3.16, but we've, sometimes we forget John 3.17 that says that he, the Son did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And that's why we can bring our failures and our addictions, because he didn't come to condemn us, he actually came to save us. And so we praise the Lord for that. And as we begin our, our Advent uh, uh, celebration today, today's the first day of Advent, uh, we look forward to the conversations around Jesus coming not to condemn us, but to save us and to bring us to God the Father. So we're glad you're with us this morning as we do celebrate those things, and as we look to the Lord. And I want to make a couple announcements this morning. I want to uh, mention that guess who is coming to dinner is actually coming up on Saturday, December 3rd. And if you signed up for Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, you will be receiving or have already received your invitation telling you where to go. All you have in here is an address and a time, so be there. If you have not signed up, I'm being told that there are a few open slots. And so if you would like to sign up for Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, there's a couple open slots. Talk to Pastor Brandon. He has invitations ready for you. And so if that's of interest to you, do talk to him today. That's 6 o'clock on Saturday, December 3rd. We would encourage you to participate in that as it allows us to fellowship with each other in, a, in an interesting sort of way. And so we encourage that uh, this morning. Also want to mention that uh, the Women's uh, Fellowship uh, Cookie Exchange is coming up December 10th. And so you can, uh, uh, ladies, consider that as well and grab a flyer in the kiosk as you look forward to uh, celebrating Christmas with, with the women on December 10th with a cookie exchange for the fellowship there. And I also want to mention, too, December 18th, Sunday the 18th at uh, 11.30. So church will, their service will end around 11. At 11.30 on the 18th, um, you are, we're all invited to go to the Hallmark Care Center in Mount Vernon to do our caroling. We, uh, do the, we, this has become sort of an annual tradition that we show up on, on, on a Sunday before Christmas at the Hallmark Care Center and we sing songs for the residents there. And so if you want to participate in that, we would encourage you to do so. And more information on that will be forthcoming. Uh, in the past with COVID, we were actually singing outside through the window inside. But we're hoping this, this year we'll be able to go inside. More information on that uh, in, the in the coming weeks. Well, as I mentioned, we are starting our Advent series today, and so uh, we're looking at Christ in the Psalms. And so we'll, we'll celebrate the coming of Jesus through what the psalm writers had to say uh, over, the, over the centuries prior to, to Jesus' uh, birth. So we'll celebrate start to, starting today. We'll end on December 24th, Christmas Eve. You'll notice on this list there's not a Sunday morning, December 25th uh, service. We are not meeting on Sunday morning, December 25th. Instead, we encourage you to participate with your families and the pastors, Brandon and Stephen and I, will put together a video that will push out to the YouTube, our YouTube channel for you to watch on Sunday morning, December 25th with your family, if that's of interest to you. So we'll be meeting the next uh, four Sundays, today being one of them, plus Christmas Eve, and then on Sunday the 25th, you'll have a video to watch with your family around the fire or around the Christmas tree or however that works for you. Well, as we begin our Advent celebration this morning, we want to light the, uh, the Advent candle. And this morning, our Advent reading is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 3 through 7, where Isaiah prophesies the coming of the Messiah. And here's what Isaiah says. He says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. And they are glad when they divide the spoil for you, for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his, impressor, of his oppressor, you are broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born and to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, and on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Isaiah wrote this passage um, roughly 750 years prior to the coming of Jesus. And so the people of Israel were looking forward to his coming. They were excited about and considering the fact that the Messiah would be coming to save them. And so this morning we light the candle of prophecy commemorating that, and we too celebrate along with the Israelites with the coming Messiah. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to continue to worship the Lord together in song. Thank As we finished up 1 Peter last week, very similar cry from Peter's letter and from the Psalms, waiting for the, out of the depths of our misery, the depths of our suffering, the depths of the difficulties of this broken and sinful world, we cry out to the Lord, we wait on Him, we look with anticipation for His coming. And this year, as we look forward to Christmas to the celebration of the birth of the Messiah, we're going to look at the Psalms and look at how Israel looked with eager anticipation at the coming of the Messiah. And even today, we wait with anticipation for the coming of the Messiah, the second coming, the second advent. We celebrate Advent, we light the candles, reminding us that we're continually getting closer and closer and closer to his birth. We're also getting closer and closer to the day when he will come back and make all things right, make all things new. He will restore all things and redeem them and draw them back to himself. And as those candles continue to light week after week after week, let that be a reminder in your mind and your heart. We're one day closer. We're one day closer to the coming of our Messiah. We're one day closer when all will be fixed. There'll be no more tears, no more sadness, no more death, no more suffering. We'll all, all come face to face with our maker. And so this morning, we're going to look at Psalm 130. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We're going to read this. You're, you're going to recognize the words because the song that we just sang is, uh, I believe Shane and Shane um, put, put the, the melody together, but it's just a song mirroring this psalm. And so here's what Psalm 130 says. It says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his inequities. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, help us to see in your word that there is hope. There is the offer of forgiveness and mercy if we would just cry out to you out of the depths of our souls. Father, speak to us this morning through your spirit. Convict us where we need to be reminded of our need for a savior. Draw us, let us hit the bottom that we may look up and see you. Father, we want to be drawn into your presence. We want to see your glory shown forth. 
And this morning, Lord, we ask that you would speak through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so the psalmist here, this is a, one of the psalms of ascent as, as the Israelites would um, walk and journey to Jerusalem. Any way you come to Jerusalem, Jerusalem's on a hill, so any way you come, you're walking uphill. And the psalm of ascents were psalms, songs, these are all songs, we just don't have the, the melodies of them, but they're all songs that Israel would sing, some of lament, some of joy and hope. And this is one of the song, psalms that Israel would sing as they're rising back up to Jerusalem. And the psalmist here comes to grips with a very true fact. The fact that he is a sinner. He's hit rock bottom. He's recognized that he's not right that he's in desperate need of a Savior. He's in need of the Lord to show him mercy. And out of the depths of his misery, he cries out to the Lord for mercy. Why? Because he recognizes that he's sinful. In and through his soul, his flesh is sinful. He's not a sinner because he sins. He sins because he's a sinner That's who he is. And that terrifying reality, when he comes face to face with God, who is holy and majestic and perfect, that's a terrifying reality. But it's where all of us have to get to at some point. All of us have to get to this point. And my prayer is that you get to this point sometime in this lifetime. Because if you come to this reality after Christ has already come, after you have already died and come face to face with the judge, then it's already too late. But if we come face to face with this reality that we are sinners, that we are broken, that we are truly and utterly lost, it humbles us. It humbles us to the point where we understand that we're not right, we're not good enough. Come to the point where we recognize that if I were to have to stand before God himself, I could not, I could not even think about pleading not guilty. In my own flesh, I would have to acknowledge my sin And say, yes, Lord, I am guilty of breaking your law, of breaking your fellowship, of not hitting the mark. An encounter a few weeks ago, we walked through Romans 6.23 and talked about what sin means and the the original uh, context of sin being an archery term of missing the target. All the kids shot their arrows at the whiteboard and none of them could hit it. Missed all over the place, and that's us. We have to acknowledge our sins and see that we cannot justify ourselves before God. We're guilty. We're in trouble. We're unable to make an escape. We're unable to resist him. We're unable to even stand firm against his almighty hand. And guess what? Here's the good news of the gospel is that God knows the same thing. He knows it. He knows it too. He sees all of your sin. He sees all of your brokenness. He sees all of your rebellion. He sees the the heart inside of you that you don't let anyone else see. Because as we walk through those doors, we've gotten so accustomed to just putting on a mask and hiding the real me. Letting people see what we want them to see. The the Facebook me. The Instagram perfection of my life and family. As you saw, I'm guessing over the weekend and over the last couple days, all the perfect pictures of Thanksgiving joys and family and food. We don't post it when we're fighting with our spouse and yelling at our kids and talking about family members behind their backs. We only post the Instagram pictures. 
But this psalmist takes the mask off. And he's real in this moment. And just like him, we too need to lament over our brokenness. We need to have sorrow over our sin. Because here's what it does is it brings us to grief. And grief over sin is a good thing as long as it brings us to God. It causes us to to press in, to lean into the only one who can save, the only one who can account for our brokenness, to press into the cross as our only hope of redemption and forgiveness. And it causes us to cry out to him knowing that as I sit here and I look at who I truly am, there's nothing good in me. And so I must cry out to the Father knowing that in myself I stand no chance. I'm, I throw myself at his mercy and say, God, if you don't work, then I am lost, condemned. And the psalmist comes to this realization that he is lost. And I pray that you too have either come to this at some point or will come to this realization. If God chooses to count my sins against me, I'm ruined. I have no hope of escape. That's what he says in verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Nobody. But here's the joy of this, that I hope and I pray that you see this Christmas season, is the deeper, the deeper you see the depths of your depravity and your brokenness and your sinfulness, the deeper you see that, the better you see that, that you are completely sinful, the more appreciative we become of the mercy of God's forgiveness. Because when you're like, well, yeah, God saved me from, like, he saved me from some things. Like, yeah, like, you know, I, there's, I shouldn't have probably, you know, cheated on my taxes. I probably shouldn't have, you know, spent money in this way. I probably shouldn't have spoken to my wife like that. But I mean, that's just, those are like little, those are like white lies, right? They're not like bad sins. Like, I didn't, I didn't kill anybody, I haven't committed adultery. Like, I haven't done the bad sins. But when we begin to see that it's not just little sins that come out of us, but that throughout us we are broken and sinful, then then we see, well, God God didn't just give me a Band-Aid. He didn't just dust me off. He completely washed me clean. I was filthy. I was rolling in the mud of my sin, loving every minute of it, and he got down in the nooks and crannies cleaning me off. When we see that, then we get to the point where we're like, God, man, you're not just a good friend. You are amazing. You are worthy of my praise and my adoration and my worship. And here's the kicker, too, is like, God sees things in us that we don't even see in ourselves. He knows the depths of your sinfulness better than even your spouse does. Better than you ever will. And if God chooses to bring my depravity to light, I would be totally and completely overwhelmed. My only hope lies in the fact that God will not count my sins against me. He will not judge me based on what he sees in my heart, but he will deal with me with mercy and compassion. And your only hope is the same as mine, that you throw yourself on the forgiving mercy of God in Jesus Christ. Cry out to him. Like the psalmist, in his sorrow, in his grief, he cries out to God 
He doesn't just whisper this little small prayer. In his weeping over his sin, he's crying out to God, please, Lord, have mercy on me. And he's urging you to do the same thing, to cry out to God. Find unspeakable comfort in the fact that he offers forgiveness. Because he didn't have to. He could have just been like, man, tough luck. Here's the consequences for your sin. Deal with them. You made your bed, lie in it. All these cliches that parents use with their kids, right? But God is a good, good father. He hears your cries for mercy. He's he's attentive to your prayers. As you pray remorsefully and in repentance for your rebellion and your sins. And the psalmist says, with him there's forgiveness. With God there's forgiveness. It's available to you. He offers mercy when you approach him through his son. And guess what? That's what I need. That's what you need too. He's gracious, he's merciful, slow to anger, eager to forgive. That's how he's described throughout the entire Old Testament. You know what's crazy? Like, so I started going to church about fifth, fifth, sixth grade. Went to Sunday school, was confirmed in the Lutheran church, and um, would have called myself a believer throughout all of middle school, high school especially. I got to college and actually started reading this for the first time myself, and recognized that, like, yeah, I knew the Sunday school uh, stories. I knew about Noah's Ark. I, I knew about David and Goliath. I knew about a lot of these things, but I didn't know him. And so my mindset of God was like, okay, so God was this mean, spiteful, vindictive, vengeful God in the Old Testament. You know, the old Bruce Almighty, smite me, oh mighty smiter. That, that mentality in the Old Testament. Big guy with the magnifying glass standing over my ant hill. And then something happened with Jesus, and Jesus changed God in the New Testament. That was my mindset, even going into college. It was this difference of God. Heavy, weighty, merciful, loving. The way God's described in the Old Testament is not vindictive, spiteful, mean God. Listen to this. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. He's described, I better turn to it so I actually get it right. Exodus 34. Says this. This is Moses. So get this. This is what's crazy. God gives the Ten Commandments. He gives his revelation to his people. Moses comes down the mountain, and what are the people doing? They're worshiping a stupid golden calf that they made themselves from the stuff that they got out of Egypt. They're worshiping it and having revelries down here at the base of the mountain while God himself is meeting with Moses at the top of the mountain, giving him his revelation and his law, welcoming them into become his people. Moses comes down and he's torqued off and he launches the tablets and they shatter. So in Exodus 34, guess what God does? Kills all the Israelites, right? No! He's like, Moses, Why don't you make new tablets for these people who are ignorant, don't know what they're doing? Look at verse 6 and 7. It says, The Lord, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. That's how God's described. Right after God rescues his people, the Red Sea parts, he walks them through it. They come to the mountain, great and terrible, his presence comes down on the mountain. They start worshiping false gods like that. Default mode, go right into sin. And God still is described, 
God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's the God of the Old Testament. You see it again in Nehemiah 9. You see it again in Daniel 9. You see it again in Jonah. When Jonah's like, hey, I've been called to go to the Ninevites to call them to repent. And Jonah's like, peace out, I'm going the other way. Why? Well, we see it at the end of the book. Ne- uh, Jonah says why he chose to go the other direction. Because he's like, I hate those dirty, rotten Ninevites. I hate them. They're mean and they're cruel and they're nasty. And I knew God. I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that if I went and they chose to repent, that you would forgive them. And I didn't want them to get forgiveness. That's Jonah. Sounds a lot like me. Jonah knew God was a God of mercy and grace and forgiveness. And he laments that God is merciful when God chooses to be merciful to those that Jonah didn't want him to be merciful toward. You see, before Jesus, the Israelites didn't know how God would redeem them. They had the promise, all the way back from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. They had the promise that God would bring a Messiah. He would bring a Savior. He would bring one who would crush the head of the serpent, who would make all things right, who would restore what Adam and Eve had broken in the garden. They knew it, and they kept getting glimpses of it, and God would reveal a little bit more of what the Messiah would be like as you go all the way through the Old Testament. And the Israelites, the true Israelites, as Paul calls them, put their faith in God into the fact that he is merciful, he is loving. But when God revealed himself through Jesus Christ, we now get to see that God didn't just sweep our sins under the rug, but that he actually paid for them, every last one of them on the cross. And so on this side of the cross, you are blessed beyond measure because you live on this side of Jesus. And you get to see the whole picture, all of it. You get to see the whole storyline. That when you cry out to God out of the depths of your sin and your misery, when we cry out to him for forgiveness and mercy, he offers it through what Jesus did on the cross, based on Jesus' shed blood. That's our only hope of being pulled out of the horrible pit of misery and sin that we find ourselves. I stand redeemed by grace alone is what we just sang in that last song. I stand redeemed, forgiven, perfect on grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ's shed blood alone. With God, there is forgiveness. That's what the psalmist wants you to hear in this song. With God, there is forgiveness. And so what do we do? Well, the psalmist tells us what to do. He pleads with you. Here's what he says. Verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. I've cried out to God. I've recognized my sin. I've acknowledged that I am not right, that I am guilty beyond measure. I've cried out to God, God, please be merciful on me, a sinner. Then you kind of peek up a little bit, right? So now what? Now what do I do? Is that it? I don't feel any different. The psalmist tells us, wait on the Lord. His soul waits on the Lord. All of his being, his entire essence, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, all of him waits expectantly for the Lord. Why? He does so because of what's written in God's word. His hope is fixed on what God has said he would do. You know, the name Jesus, transliterated from Greek, Jesus, transliterated from Hebrew, Yeshua, 
That name was given to sons as a symbolic hope for the Lord's anticipated coming, for his anticipated sending of a Messiah that would offer salvation for the people. The name symbolized the promise of God that he would send one who would purify his people and save them from their sins, save them from their enemies. And the entire, the the promise of God bringing salvation for his people was a, a repeated promise throughout the Old Testament. We see it over and over and over again. We wait expectantly, trusting and hoping in God's word, believing what God has promised in his word to us. So like we said, promised all the way back in Genesis 3.15 that he would raise a deliverer who would crush the head of the serpent, repeated in almost every single Old Testament book. Isaiah 40, verse 2, God says, her iniquity is pardoned. And then verse 3 says, so prepare ye the way of the Lord, which is recited again with John the Baptist. Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jeremiah 31 speaks about the new covenant where God promises, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, he promises to clean you from all of your uncleanness. Daniel 9, 24, where the 70 weeks will finish the transgression. It will put an end to sin and it will atone for iniquity. Zechariah 13, 1, the fountain is open to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Pointing to the chapter right before Zechariah 12, where it spoke about the one whom they have pierced. The thing is, church, we wait expectantly for the Lord just like the Israelites did in the Old Testament times. Because we believe that he will fulfill his promises. And we're in that tension period, the already but not yet. Like, yep, he saved me from my sins. Yep, I, I see that sin is losing its grip on me. I see that I'm, I'm becoming more holy. But I'm not there yet. I'm still a work in progress. I'm not perfected yet. I'm not glorified yet, but I see those in the promise. We're in that tension period. And so just like the Jews sat with their eyes on the horizon, waiting for the Messiah to come, for them to see the salvation of the Lord. Well, okay, we, we, we can see that. That was found in Jesus. But we're still waiting, looking at the horizon saying, now fulfill it completely. I, I got a taste of it. I got a taste and I, I can't put my fork down. I need more. It's, for me, it's French soup pie. Like you get one taste and you got you to eat as many pieces as are in the pie tin, right? The reason that we keep our eyes fixed on the horizon waiting for Jesus to come back is because we trust him. We believe that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. We believe his word. We hope in his word as we wait. And we keep looking at it. I'm like, man, I got to get a little bit more in me. Because I know that there's more promises in here that I haven't pulled into my heart yet. And there's more pieces in here in his word that is going to give me more hope and more anticipation. And continue to build the excitement in my heart. And I hold fast to those promises. Because guess what? My flesh doesn't want me to. My flesh wants to convince me that your hope is in you. My flesh wants to tell me the same lies that Satan told Eve in the garden. Did God really say that? Like, I think you're just dreaming that. Maybe you had a dream about that. And like, he didn't really say that. You're twisting God's words. Are you sure that God's not holding out on you? Are you sure that he's really offering you the best life? And my flesh continues to feed these lies and to try to manipulate us to not believe God's word. And so we have to keep going back to this. 
And be like, nope, it says right here, God said, with you there is forgiveness. God said, he promised, I'm coming back to redeem my people. And we hold fast to those promises. But here's the thing. It's like when we wait, we're not just waiting for an outcome. Our wait is for the Savior. The wait is not for something to happen that I want to happen. I'm not clinging on to the hope that all things will work out the way that I want them to. The way I think they should. The way I would have done it. You see, the Psalms, the Psalms are songs of hope. But they're not hope that our situation will change. They're songs of hope in the God who makes all things new. The God who is worthy to be worshiped, the God who is worthy of our trust. Our hope is in the living God himself. Psalm 37, verse 7 says, I wait patiently for him. It's Christ that we wait for. Even in David's misery, he knows he's going to be the next king of Israel. King Saul's king right now, and God has anointed David. He has promised him, you will be the next king. And so what's David do? He doesn't run into the throne room and put an ax through King Saul. He waits patiently. And how does God reward him? He rewards him with, well, Saul tries to kill him multiple times. And David ends up fleeing and hiding in caves. And it almost seems like a storybook, well, maybe a, I don't know, a bad storybook, but like he brings King Saul right to the, to the mouth of the cave where David is, and Saul and all of his people are sleeping. And in the movies, you'd be like, oh, this is the time. You shouldn't have fallen asleep right there. King David's going to come out, slaughter them all. He's the hero. Walks into Jerusalem. Everybody praises him, right? David comes out with his knife, and he cuts off the corner of Saul's robe, and then goes back. Just to say, I could have, but I chose not to. I'm not going to kill the Lord's anointed. He's waiting on the Lord's timing, on the Lord's salvation. He does the opposite of what Abraham and Sarah did. He does the opposite of what every sin-stained person would probably have done in that situation. We wait patiently for Christ because it is Christ who will satisfy me. Only Christ. I will wait for you, the way the song goes, until my soul is satisfied. I will wait for you, for your love is my delight. Is that how we wait as the church? Verse 4 says, with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. You see, God's purpose in forgiveness is that we may fear him. Not, not fear as in being scared of, but feared as in reverence toward him. Being in awe of him, astonished at who he is and how he acts. That he would be praised and worshipped and served in reverence. He is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And when Jesus himself is the one that I wait for, the one that I long for, the one that I yearn for, I yearn for the day when I will get to see him face to face and feel the warmth of his embrace. As he says, welcome home. I've been waiting for you. I've prepared a place for you. I love you. You see, that is what sustains us that keeps me pressing forward. You see, that is when my heart finds its true satisfaction in Jesus, not in my circumstances, not in are you gonna get, are you gonna get me through this current suffering trial period? Are you gonna work things out the way I want them to with this instance? 
But instead, it's Jesus, it's you I want. I count all other things as lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing you. Is that the cry of your heart? When he is your greatest treasure, your deepest longing, the only thing that your heart waits and groans for, then he is truly glorified in you when he is your greatest prize. And the psalmist, he was waiting for the Lord. He wasn't waiting for deliverance out of his situation. He wasn't waiting for his finances to finally hit the black. He wasn't waiting for anything else. He was waiting for the Lord himself. And the way that we wait is as one who has confident assurance of his coming. Look at verse 6. <clears throat> it says, My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. We wait with eager anticipation, knowing that he will come. Knowing that when he arrives, mercy and compassion will be what he meets us with. You see, the night is darkest right before the dawn where there are no rays of light coming over the horizon. And it's in that darkest part of the night that the watchman keeps his eyes keenly on the horizon. And where's he facing? He's facing the east because he knows that's the direction the sun's going to come up over. If he's facing the west, well, he's going to be mistaken but he's keeping his eyes peeled for that very first ray of sunlight to pop over the horizon. He's keen to see it, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is coming. He can almost see it. He knows what it means, too. You see, for the watchman, the night watchman, the first ray of sunlight, when that sun popped up over the horizon, that meant his watch was over. And his replacements were coming to relieve him. And if you're standing there and you're watching the watchman on the east side of the gate and he's staring off waiting, he's like, it's coming. Here it comes. I'm getting ready. I'm almost ready. I'm ready to be done with the shift. I know that sun's going to pop up any minute now. You'd be crazy if you asked him why, why do you think the sun's going to pop up over there? Like, why? Why are you waiting? Are you sure it's going to rise today? Are you positive? Why do you wait for it? And the guy's like, of course I'm positive the sun's going to rise. Why do you ask a stupid question like that? That's the same kind of assurance we should have that Christ is coming again. When someone says, why are why are you waiting for Jesus to come back? You should look at him with absolute stupor on your face. What are you talking about? Why wouldn't I wait for him? I know he's coming back. Did you see the sunrise this morning? Jesus is coming back. He came once. He said he would come back. He's never broken his word ever in the history of ever. That exact same confidence that when he comes, forgiveness is coming as well. That's the kind of confidence we should have. His covenant is more assured than the cycle of the day and the night. It's more faithful than the rising of the sun. He will return mercy towards me. His mercy is everlasting. You know what's crazy? Is the sun and the moon, the rising of the sun, the setting of the sun, one day that's going to pass away. There will be no more sunrise to wait for. Isn't that crazy? At some point, it will be the very last sunrise. At some point, it will be the very last sunset. Because in the new heavens and the new earth, Christ is our light. There is no sun except for the Savior. And he never sets. The mercy of Jesus is more faithful than the rising of the sun because his love is eternal. His mercy will never pass away. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. 
nothing. And the waiting that we do as we wait for that sunrise, like the the watchman watching for the morning, he's not jibber-jabbering, talking, playing games, doing all kinds of other stuff. He is silently waiting. Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalm 62, 5, for God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. I can wait patiently, silently, confident in his working, confident in his plan for me, confident in his timing. But here's the problem is that silence and stillness is something we've lost in today's age. I was thinking about this the other day. I was trying to think of the last time that I sat in a waiting room silent and still without getting my phone out, without having a book to read, without picking up one of the Dozens of magazines sitting on the side tables. When was the last time you just sat and were silent? No distractions. Nothing but a clear mind and quiet. For some of you, it's probably when you're sitting in the deer stand or the blind. When were you silent? before the Lord. You see, we want to be busy. We want to be entertained while we wait. With children, you recognize this real quickly. They always want something to do. They sit for 30 seconds on the couch, and they're like, I'm bored. What are we going to do? Yet as adults, we do the same thing. We've lost the ability to simply sit in silence to wait patiently, to sit and be still and be quiet, to hear that still small voice of the Lord, to wait on him without the need to do, without the need to speak my peace, without the need to act. God, you're taking too long, so I'll just do it myself. You know, football, football season's a crazy time for me. Never a dull moment running a million miles an hour and my brain's going faster and there's never a second where I'm not running from one place to another, trying to watch more game tape or thinking through plans, working on ministry things in the pauses. But over the last week, I've had some opportunities, a few of them, to just sit and be still, not have to worry about what the next game plan is. Not have to worry about what are they going to do on third and long. And I don't get many silent moments in my house um, with four daughters. But I got a few this week while they finished up school. And it's been so good to my soul to be still and know that he is God. I encourage you this week, go go read Psalm 46. We're not going to preach on it this series But just go read Psalm 46. If we had more time, I'd just read through it. But the gist of Psalm 46 is that God is our strength. He's our refuge. He is our place of help in times of trouble. And here's here's what it says. We will not fear though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. God makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, the bow, and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And here's how he ends the psalm. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. It's not up to you. God will be exalted. Be still, be silent, 
be quiet and just know he is God. We wait with confident assurance knowing that he is God, that he will be exalted. He will be exalted. We wait with our eyes in the horizon watching for the dawn. We wait with confident assurance that his return is near. We wait expecting the Lord's forgiveness, expecting his mercy. My soul waits knowing that his dawn is coming. It will not always be night. And I cry out to him in the depths knowing he hears and he will answer. And the last thing, Psalmist closes up his song with a plea, a plea to the people, to us, to join him in putting our hope in the Lord. Because, you see, in the advent of the Lord, advent means coming, arrival. In the advent of the Lord, in his coming to us, is steadfast love and full redemption from your sins. Look at verse 8. Full redemption. He will redeem Israel from all of his iniquities. All of them. Complete pardon. Full acquittal. And the phrase there in verse 8 should remind us of Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Where the angel comes to Joseph in a dream. Because he's thinking about how to divorce Mary quietly because she's pregnant. I did not sleep with her. Thus, she must have slept with someone else. We need to end this marriage agreement. He's like, I'm going to do it quietly because I'm an honorable man. I don't want to shame her. I don't want to disgrace her in town. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it quietly. And Joseph goes to sleep and an angel comes to him. And the angel assures him, this is the Lord's doing. And here's what he says. The angel says to Joseph in verse 21, Matthew 1, 21. He says, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from their sins. With Jesus comes full redemption from your sins. In Christ, there is abundant mercy, abundant forgiveness it is full. It abounds out of. It's not limited. It cannot be exhausted. His mercy is enough for all of the needs of the sinful and all of the suffering. The provisions of his mercy and grace are inexhaustible. We went down to Florida this spring to do the whole Disney thing. And what was my, One of my favorite parts of vacation was just sitting on the beach at the end of the week watching the waves crash in the same beach that's no longer there because of the hurricane but the waves just kept coming and they kept coming and they kept coming and they kept coming and you're like how many waves are there in the ocean right like, have you ever thought about that it's kind of a stupid question but like they just keep coming they don't stop but that's what the mercy of god is like it's inexhaustible. They don't run out. They just keep coming like clockwork all the time. It keeps coming. It never runs out. It's like the ocean. It's still plentiful after millions and millions and millions of waves. There's still waves crashing against the shore. Or how about the sun that's shone forth for ages and ages, and it continues to shine. It continues to give its warmth with undiminished splendor and glory. There is no end to the mercy of the Lord. There is no limit to his amazing love for you. You see, we find forgiveness and redemption in the mercy of the Lord through Jesus. He will completely and eternally save his people. He will completely and eternally deliver us from the clutches and power and stain of sin. We will be washed white as freshly fallen snow, pure and clean before our loving Father, and he wraps us in his spotless robes of his Son. The psalm 
begins with the depths of despair and sin and brokenness. Begins in the world. But it ends at the highest heights of heaven. Triumphant hope of complete and eternal deliverance, forgiveness and salvation. Because in Christ there is hope. Do not despair. Do not fear. The morning will dawn. His light will break forth. Joy will come with the morning. Put your hope in him, your trust in him alone. The psalmist says, do as I have done. Cry out. He is faithful. I have found him merciful. Follow me to the Savior. He is coming. And as we wait for the second coming, We wait and we watch, knowing it's as sure as the rising of the sun. Heavenly Father, we need you. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. In ourselves, we are lost and without hope in this world. But with you, there is forgiveness, there is mercy, there is joy in abundance Our hearts cry out that you and you alone satisfy. And Lord, as our hearts find their full satisfaction in you, may we cry out to those around us, come join me as I wait for my Savior. And help us to keep our eyes fixed on the horizon, knowing that at some moment, any moment, your ray of light will pop over that mountain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We know he's coming. It's as sure. We're confident of it. He's promised it. He's written it down in his word for us that we may not even question it. But what will we do as we wait, as the butterflies start to to flutter around in our stomachs, knowing he's coming back. Light those candles. Begins to become more. Then there's two. Then there's three. Then there's four. You're waiting for the day. And as we wait silently in the stillness, in the calm, not agitated by all the waters around us, raging and roaring around us, all the happenings of this world, we're still and we're calm because we're fixed to the rock that is Jesus, and he's immovable. He's not moving. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to fail you. So as we get excited for Christmas this year, as we walk through this Advent season preparing for his arrival, remember, he is God. Nothing is impossible for him. Nothing can pull us out of his hands. Nothing can separate you from his love. Rejoice in that this Advent season. Rejoice in that and sing, we will wait for you. Go church, go and be blessed. So 